I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we're stepping back into the summer of 1989. Do you remember it? Do you experience it? Do you feel it? It was a great summer, absolutely. We're talking about a powerful book. It's called Dreaming in 89 by T.G. Monahan. This nostalgic coming-of-age novel follows Sebastian Riggs on his quest to buy a vintage stunt RC plane and prove himself to his father and his peers. Full of 1980s throwbacks, ambition, and unexpected twists, it's a story about dreams, self-discovery, and the secrets lurking in a small town. We're delighted to have this very talented author join us here today on Spotlight. We thank the team at Sweet Spire Literature Management for helping us put him in the spotlight today. And we ask viewers like you to support authors like him by subscribing to our channel and by purchasing his wonderful book. The links are below this interview. Todd, great to see you here today. Thanks for joining me. Thank you very much for having me, Logan. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to have you on the show. Loved your book. Like I said, I'm a child of the 80s, kind of come came of age, graduated high school in 1980. Uh, so this really brought me back. Um, why did you decide to set a novel in the 80s? That's a great question. Well, I have to say that this book is, if not a memoir, it certainly um, reflects my, my own life experience that I had um, during that particular summer. Um, I was 12 years old, much like my my protagonist in the book, and I um, I too the only thing I could uh, the only thing I could think of was earning enough money to buy a um, a radio controlled airplane. That was my passion. That was my reason for existing um, at that particular time. And it was a very sort of it was one of those real inflection points in my life um, where you know I wasn't the same before and after. And it always stuck in the back of my mind. And I knew that when I became a writer, I wanted to turn it into something I could share with the rest of the world. I'm glad you did. And it really brought me back. I don't think um, this generation will ever know the wonder of going into a radio shack and shopping for something like a RC plane or an RC car or some kind of contraption. Everything's done on the phone now. It was such a more interesting and visual time, don't you think, the 1980s? It was. It was really the end of the of the analog world and the beginning of the digital world. And, you know, radio-controlled airplanes, I remember when I started um, learning about them and building them, I would take all the old books out of the library, and they were from the 40s and 50s, you know, when you still had to build things out of wood and you had to solder, solder all your own wire connections. Um you know, it was a it was a different world. It's it's a hobby. It's a hobby from a, from a bygone day, and um, it's a fascinating hobby. And and it, it, it's something that that had always captured my imagination, and it's something that I wanted to sort of reintroduce to this generation. Absolutely. Let's give the folks at home an overview of the story. You have Sebastian sure. Riggs. He's twelve years old. He's basically you, but a little fictionalized here and there, of yes. course. And he wants to buy an RC or a radio-controlled plane. Uh, give us. There's more to the story, of course. So give sure. us a little bit more. So, <clears throat> really, what this story is about is about Sebastian's relationship with his father, and really his his prime. Um, motivating motivating desire here is to not only obtain the airplane but to become um a, a, a radio controlled stunt pilot like his father had been when he was younger um my character views this sort of as the way to or misguidedly i would add sort of views this as the way to earn his father's respect um to get back into his father's good graces um, because as um, you know, I don't want to give away the whole story, but the reader will find that there had been an, in an incident um, in the not too distant past. Um, you know, when, when the, from when the book begins where Sebastian and his father had something of a, um, I don't want to say falling out, but something very serious came between them. And that really, um, sent sent him into into something of a spiral uh self-esteem wise and he really feels the need to reestablish um reestablish that rapport that he had with his father and to be accepted um to be accepted as a as an up-and-coming man and a, and a valued member of the family 
and he views this airplane as um, the means by which to attain that. Exactly. It's a common bond between him and his father. His father did it. He wants to do it. And uh, I think it's perfect because it kind of captures the essence of that era. Like we said, a much more simple time where a very, you know, high tech device was an art radio controlled plane. You know, nowadays we can fly drones off of our phones. Not nearly as much fun, though, of course. Part of the story is um, bullies. There's yes. some bullying going on with Seb's character. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So <clears throat> bullying is, as you pointed out, one of the primary themes of this story. And what I wanted to really emphasize was bullying is not a bullying is not a clear cut phenomenon. Bullying happens on many levels. Um, an individual who could be bullied um, often turns around and bullies others. Um, who he or she perceives as weaker uh, than they are. Um, bullying is something that you pass along, and it's something that um, starts at the top. Um, so there are bullying occurs on various levels in this story. Um, I think you'll see that Se that Seb gets bullied, but he also does his fair share of bullying, and I think his real probably his biggest moral revelation in this story is realizing that he is, or he has become part of the problem. Um, and it's, it's only, it's only when he takes accountability for that um, and decides to break that chain that I think he's able to heal um, and realize, <clears throat> you know, the way to live a better life. Um so bullying was always very important. It was always very important to me um, to sort of to demonstrate how bullying is not cut and dry and the people who sometimes can be perceived as bullies in, in a more black and white story really are suffering in their own lives. Um, exactly. Bullying is contagious. You might have been slapped yes. around by your dad. So you become a bully. You've been bullied at school. Now you're bigger than the kids who lives next to you. You know, so absolutely bullying is contagious. And uh, you do have an absolute interesting spin on bullying in your book. It's very nuanced as well. Won't give it away, of course. Let's talk a little bit about have you envisioned this as a movie? I mean, I love things set in the 80s because it brings me back. And like we said, it's a more visual time. So this um, <clears throat> this story actually started its life as a screenplay. Um, mm -hmm. I started writing it as a screenplay, but then I realized that um, it would probably be best if I started, if I wrote it as a novel and then gave it the screenplay treatment in the fullness of time. So yes, the, 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 um, the visual medium, the film medium is in this story's DNA. It was always intended to be viewed. Um, and I do, um, I, I very much do see this as a movie and hope that we can get to a point where it will be made into a movie. Um, I've had some overtures in the past. Um, I have some very, very, uh, from some very clear ideas about how I, you know, what I, what I see it as, I, I've always kind of viewed it as a, um, a combination of, um, a Christmas story and stand by me. Yeah, I, 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 I agree has, with that a hundred percent. It reminded has, me of yeah, both those films. Yeah. yeah I would I love think, to see somebody like Cameron Crowe take this project and because I think he always he, puts such a beautiful soundtrack on things and you know, yes. you could have a little, you know, Donna Summer, a little Wham, a little Madonna, I mean, you could have such a great soundtrack to go with this film. It'd be incredible, right? Absolutely. I've already picked out many of the songs that I that I think would be appropriate for some of the scenes. But I do think I think um, you know, there's a there's a, there's certainly a, um, a comedic aspect of the story, but there's also some darker undertones that I that I um, for something like um, you know something like Stand by Me. Um, I've always viewed this as a movie and it's my goal. One of my goals in life is to make sure that it becomes one. Well, you put the work out there now. You have a screenplay already to go. It was the screenplay first, but just putting the work out there as a novel, I think is great because you never know whose hands it's going to wind up in, but you got to do me a favor. If it becomes yes. a movie, consider me for uh, Seb's dad. I think I could <laughs> yeah, I, 
call. You'll be my first call, my friend. Okay, that would be great. That'd be great. And save a role for yourself as well. It's always good to have the uh, the auteur appear in the film, a la Alfred <laughs> Hitchcock or something like that. Before we leave you today, let me just ask you this. What do you hope that readers take away from your book? I hope that readers are reminded of a wonderful time in, in our history when, when you were really allowed to be a kid, um, when life was simpler, life was more, like we said, life was more analog, life was more hands-on and gritty, people interacted with each other, people had to show up for each other on a daily basis. I, I, I want people to experience the 1980s as I did, which was really, it was really a magical time. And I don't know if we'll ever, ever um, have something like that again um, with the technology we have in this world. And just for myself, I want people to be, to be inspired. Um, it's always been a dream of mine since I was a little kid, since I first um, started reading um, I wanted to be a real, a real author. And I'm very proud to say that I've, I've gotten there and I want other people to know that they can do the same and that the sky is the limit. If you dream big and you put in the work. Exactly. I agree a hundred percent. You know, the page is a blank canvas. You can do anything with it. It can take you anywhere. It can take you back in time. It can bring you into the future. It can reinvent the world. It can turn things upside down. So that's the magic of a blank page and a word processor or a computer or a pencil or whatever it is and turning those dreams, those thoughts, those visions, those memories into magic like you've done here. This book is called Dreaming in 89 by T.G. Mon Monahan. It is a nostalgic coming-of-age novel that follows Sebastian Riggs on his quest to buy a vintage stunt RC airplane and prove himself to his dad and to his peers. And there's a whole lot more going on here. It's a wonderful story. Hollywood, this would be a great movie, in case you're listening. All right. Todd, thank you so much for joining me here today on Spotlight. Thank you very much, Logan. It's been a, it's been a real pleasure. It's been a pleasure talking to you today. I've Appreciate your time, your wisdom, and your insight. To the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time, this time, until next time, on Spotlight.